Hey, well, I'm really excited to be here with Ali Kashani, the CEO of Sir Robotics. Ali, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. You guys have been working hard. I've seen lots of news coming out of Sir Robotics, including the most recent news that you guys hit level four autonomy. And I want to jump into that first, but just to kind of give the listeners a little bit of background on you know your journey towards what your latest milestones. How did, how did you get involved with autonomous sidewalk delivery robots? Yeah, you know, we've had a fairly unique story. Uh, we started inside the industry. Uh, I was brought into Postmates through an acquisition of my startup back in 2017. And my role was to actually start a new division uh, that focused on sidewalk delivery. It was called Postmates X. So we basically started from zero uh, in 2017, built a team at Postmates, launched the robots in 2019, uh, did over 10,000 deliveries in 2020, for example, during COVID on the Postmates platform from 100 plus restaurants to thousands of households in LA. And um, I started actually working on spinning that off, uh, that team into an independent company, because we realized that if we stay within Postmates, we would only be doing deliveries for Postmates, which at the time was about 10% of the market. That meant that we would be leaving 90% of the market for competitors, uh, and they would get better economy of scale. You know, it would, it, would, it would not make a lot of sense. That would be bad even for Postmates because then they would have an inferior kind of economics uh, on robotics. So as I started the process, the Uber acquisition happened. So after Uber completed the acquisition, we proposed the same thing to them. They were on board. So we became an independent company with Uber as an investor and a backer and, you know, with a commercial agreement in place with them. It makes so much sense to spin out and have that much more wider addressable market. Um, but you guys, like you said, you had some traction. You did, I think you said tens of thousands of, of I think, deliveries. Uh, I think, was that in 2020, 2021? 2020, 2020 we did over 10,000. I think over the lifetime, we've done tens of thousands, yeah. And most of those up to this point have taken place, am I right, in, in California? It does seem like a lot of the early trials for these are happening in kind of the Southern California area. That's that's true. So we have offices actually in San Francisco, in LA, and we have uh, we've had offices in Vancouver as well. At this pre-COVID, we had a you know formal office. Now it's mostly a, a you know remote team there. Uh, so we did testing in Vancouver as well. Great. So to the point where you are now, you have this robot, um, and how much has this evolved? Are we kind of on like a uh, the latest generation, What is is this something that evolved quite a bit from those early days when you were starting to work on it within Postmates uh, to where you are now? Absolutely. So, um, you know, it was a very different time. I think we started when the industry was still in the first wave of autonomy, and I kind of consider now the second wave. Um, a lot has happened since, a lot of uh, changes in how the you know industry is approaching the problem now. Back in 2016, 2017, uh, everyone was talking about full autonomy with, you know, cameras. That was kind of the talk of the town. So Tesla was promising that, you know, taxi robots are going to be around the corner, like end of next year or this year. Uh, and other, a lot of other autonomy companies were saying similar things about like reaching level five very soon. Um, we kind of actually took a contrarian approach at the time, which was to really focus on teleoperation as a first step. So I actually have a PhD in robotics myself. I'd spent uh, years uh, in academia working on sensors like cameras and LIDARs and using them side by side. So my thesis was that autonomy is not quite there. And the best solution is the right combination of teleoperation, which is basically using human intelligence and uh, you know autonomy, which uses AI. So, to get started as quickly as possible, we started with teleoperation. We made our very first robot within a month and did our very first customer delivery within a month. And uh, we scaled that, did thousands of customer deliveries as we slowly introduced AI and autonomy to the robot. Now today, we've come a really long way to the point that as we announced last week, the robots are now capable to operate at level four. And just to kind of explain to uh, folks who may not follow the industry really well, um, level five is where the robots or cars can drive themselves completely all the time. And most experts, I would say, argue today that that's 
still decades away. So the idea that we can completely automate everything is 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 not something that anyone thinks would be feasible right now. Level four is the holy grail, where you have the ability to, for robots to be independent of any human help or supervision uh, in some areas, and in other areas they would they would require help basically. Level two and level three is where people are kind of having their hands on the wheel, ready to jump in and help for safety. For example, Tesla is level two. So that kind of gives a pretty good um, you know, view of what those uh, different milestones are. We've now reached commercial deployment of level four, which means in some areas of LA where we operate, the robots can actually be uh, you know, free of humans in the loop, meaning that no one has to be watching over a video or walking with the robot. The robot can do their thing. And then whenever they need help, they would ask for it and, and someone can remotely step in and help. So when we look at level four, are there different levels of that within that say you know having your your delivery robot go on a specific uh geo dictated path right like maybe within the city block that you, you've mapped out um versus hey let's move towards level four where it can basically go largely anywhere within the city so is there a kind of a evolution within that particular uh level yeah i think you know you you can think about it in terms of uh, operating areas we're gonna be expanding that obviously over time so that requires some training and, and modeling that happens over time as we go to new neighborhoods or new cities. Um, and then, you know, even within the kind of, you know, uh, the level itself, within within uh, the, the uh, parameters of autonomy, you have things like speed, you have things like, uh, you know, how does it interact with people? Uh, does it pause to, um, you know, resolve situations? Uh, how often does it do that? So there's a lot of other uh, ways to improve. So this is going to be a very continuous improvement process. But to be able to turn off the camera today is is a big deal because that means that we actually have built quite a lot of safety features so that the robots can be safe independent of human supervision. Um, and uh, maybe it's actually worth kind of mentioning a lot of what autonomy is, the way autonomy is done today in the cars or even on sidewalk, sidewalks is someone remotely sometimes driving or just watching over the robots to kind of step in and help. That's why they're not, you know, level four. The problem is that we've actually seen this through our own experience. People make mistakes. Those remote operators can make mistakes. And uh, the video feeds, the LT networks that you rely on, anyone with a cell phone would know. They caught up. Anyone on a Zoom uh, would know this, right? So we kind of had to become independent of those video links and, and uh, you know, the human error. So that the robots are safe enough as we scale. So you guys aren't completely doing away though with human teleoperators, the pilots, right? I mean, one of the things I imagine going to level four means is just having one person overseeing a larger fleet. I mean, I mean, one of the things I think is kind of also the holy grail is just you know if you do have some sort of teleoperator in the background to resolve issues or whatever. Uh, maybe they can do that over a fleet of like 10 to 20 robots. So talk about where you are using human teleoperators and what they're doing now. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think, as I said before, completely removing humans out of the loop uh, in all conditions, it is far from reality. It's also not, uh, it doesn't make a lot of business sense. Uh, if you think about it in terms of, you know, return on investment, uh, if you have a robot, if you have multiple robots, let's say 10 robots being operated by one person, making that 11 is a marginal kind of gain in, in your cost structure versus uh, you can invest that in, in a lot of other areas. Uh, so the idea was always from the beginning to get that best hybrid of humans and kind of robots intelligence. You can think of those uh, supervisors that we call them supervisors they, you can think of them as like customer support in a way uh, in any platform you have folks you have humans who take over when the platform can't do the job when things are kind of the odd edge cases even our supervisors a lot of their job right now is helping customers and merchants so when a robot gets to a location the supervisors actually help make sure that that transaction is smooth and customers and, and merchants have a good experience. So the, over time, they, their role could be more, more and more about this kind of human interactions. It's funny. I, I, we, we wrote last week about a company um, that is deploying AI to 
drive throughs at Checkers restaurants. And uh, I think the stat that they gave was they're at 90, 98% accuracy. So you can basically do uh, an AI-driven bot conversation to take an order at a drive through with 98% accuracy, accuracy, but there's still that 2% where you have like the supervisor intervening. So it sounds like we're kind of at a similar phase with teleoperation and level four based uh, sidewalk robots. Yeah, you know, I actually have um, worked in a few other industries and worked on a kind of machine learning based products before uh, joining Postmates. And the theme is very similar. I think in any application, uh, you're gonna see domains where humans and machines can work together uh, to get commercialized before, uh, before you have applications where machines can completely do something by themselves. I mean, ATMs, you know, before the age of AI, ATMs were kind of automated teller machines. Uh, they do some really basic tasks, but those are very repetitive tasks. And then you have humans in the bank kind of dealing with uh, all those other edge cases and uh, everything else. It's kind of the same model and it makes a lot of sense. I don't think you gain a lot by trying to achieve full kind of autonomy or full AI capability unless you're in environments where safety demands that. So you, you kind of have to have AI that can make all the decision by itself, otherwise you will be unsafe. Then you're in a different kind of problem space and it's a much more expensive type of problem space. I wrote a piece this morning about how Bear Robotics is uh, working with UNLV th through their hospitality university, um, giving access to hospitality majors uh, to robotics and use, deploying those in hospitality scenarios. Um, there's another company called Carbon Origins that I wrote about that is basically hiring VR skilled uh, teleoperators for their delivery robots. So it, there's this um, new almost job classification and kind of skill set for people within the hospitality industry to uh, allow them to work with, operate, manage robotics. So I think you guys are probably on the front lines of that as well. Absolutely. I think it's one of the first applications with uh, self-driving de delivery is one of the first applications where machines are going to be in public spaces uh, by themselves. And then humans are going to be basically sitting at home behind a computer and helping those machines whenever those edge cases happen. And a lot of times those edge cases have to do with other humans and interactions between robots and humans. All right, putting on your futures hat, we're making predictions uh, this week at The Spoon. When you look at food delivery automation, what are you kind of excited for over the next couple of years? Where do you, where do you see your, go, your company going and the industry going? I, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't kind of dare to, to predict things in the, in, in, in the field of technology. There's always new surprises, but I can tell you where we want to go and I can tell you where I think it makes sense to go. Um, when you think about short distance delivery in general, um, the cost and, and kind of the labor uh, hasn't really uh, improved uh, over the last hundred years the way that, let's say, long haul delivery has. So just, uh, I guess, for me, prediction usually works best when you kind of uh, extrapolate from some trends from the past. So that, that's a helpful way to look at it. Um, when you actually consider cost of long haul shipping, uh, just about 100 years ago, we were still using uh, camel trains to move goods. And, you know, one human basically in these trains would be in charge of a few camels and a, a few hundred goods. Today, you have sailors in cargo ships, uh, uh, like 20 of them moving hundreds of millions of goods. So there's like a five order of magnitude change in the way we use labor there, where one person can be moving tens of millions of items, uh, you know, across uh, the seas. But when you actually look at short distance deliveries, uh, we can actually look at USPS uh, productivity, like how many mail pieces of mail they delivered 100 years ago versus today that data is available. The improvement is about 2x. Despite all the technology improvements we've seen, there's only a 2x improvement in how much more productive we have become, not even a single order of magnitude, basically. To me, that's what's about to happen. We are finally introducing kind of automation and AI uh, to our transportation layer, to our transportation infrastructure. And the way we are moving goods today in the short distance doesn't make a lot of sense. It costs like $10 to get you something from Chinatown. It costs $2 to get you something from China. So 5,000 feet is $10, 5,000 miles is $2. This is, this is the problem you're trying to solve. So my prediction for the next few years is you're going to see different modality of robots, uh, like sidewalk delivery robots, which are likely going to be the first, and then robots on the streets. Uh, you, you're going to have different applications for different environments. 
uh, that are going to be finally introduced to our lives. We are kind of at that stage that we have everything. We are now uh, starting to put these robots to use at a, at a, a you know, larger scale. The CEO of, of Waymaker, when they introduced the NAMI, they talked about this idea of eventually getting towards fully automated delivery from kind of the point of origin all the way to the consumer's home. One of the things that I think you need, needs to happen there is just kind of the in, kind of integration at the connection points, right? So having one robotic system talk to another. Is that something you guys are working on saying, hey, we want to be able to help uh, folks who are creating automated food production, uh, pick it up, deliver it, get it to the consumer home. Those integration points are something you're thinking on about? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting question and it's a conversation that we've had with multiple partners before. I should say WaveMaker is actually an investor uh, in Serve Robotics. Um, so it's definitely been a topic of interest. Uh, I think it's still early days for figuring out what makes sense uh, and at what level, but uh, we are probably not too far from it because if you think about it from a just cost minimization or cost optimization framework, uh, we are We've made a lot of progress when it comes to the cost of field operation and remote operation. So there's going to be a you know not too distant future in which that kind of uh, you know warehouse operation or or you know pickup points kind of operation is going to be the target of optimization. Hey, well, Ali Kashani was served. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely, pleasure.